Buhay! It's me, your girl in Dynamo! And welcome back to my Taglish channel! side of the universe so guys another day another gala another attraction for today's video are you ready for a winery tour guys for today what are you waiting for happy watching Sapple Wines is one of the most famous wineries in Australia initially founded in 1863 by brothers Joseph and Henry Bess who came to the region in search of gold. The property was sold to Hans Urban in 1888 following Joseph's accidental death and again in 1918 on Hans Urban's retirement to Venno Sapple. Oh no, I've got an email. Welcome to the Sapple, the Great Western Winery was founded in 1865 by Joseph Bass with the excavation of the drives commencing in 1868. Get some of the grapes on it yet. Yeah. Normally there's only the one in Hall's Gap, which is Fallen Giants on Wade Vazoo. Most of them are around here. Is it the one there, right? The one, the one in the zoo? Yeah, yeah, the one near there. So there's only the one in Hall's Gap and the rest are kind of around here, Great Western and Ararat. It's probably like I said, Wade Horsham, but there's a lot there. <laughs> there you go. Hang on, it's just two or two. Cellar Door offers wine tasting, licensed cafe, museum, and historical guided underground cellar too. The property is well known as the perfect venue for weddings, functions, underground dining, and live music events. Up naked eyes. Today, Sepple Wine is one of the Australia's most well-known and respected wineries producing award-winning cool climate wines vintage after vintage, including the iconic Sepple Show Sparkling Shiraz and Sepple St. Pito Shiraz, named after the original vineyard planted in Great Western. Yes, as Sapelt was a leader in Australian winemaking and they bought this uh, vineyard. So, 
when Joseph Best discovered the ground on the site was made of a rock band decomposed granite and easily dug yet solid compound, he co commissioned local gold miners to tunnel underground cellars to store his wines. These cellars are also known to his these days as the drives. Yeah, I think so. Ladder. Nah, don't know. There's probably a door out there, I'd say. Sapples Wines is also well known for having the longest underground cellars in Australia with over 3 kilometers of hand dog drops beneath the winery. With Australia's harsh climate, the cellars were dug 7 meters below the surface to regulate temperatures for more than 3 million bottles that were stored during production. The first underground drive was dug in 1865 and continued until the 1950s, expanding storage as production levels increased. style you'll see as we wander a bit further down beautiful front to the veranda there's even a little ballroom there you can hire that out uh, it's empty at the moment we have accommodation there sleeps about 14 and we do a bit of glamping around the yards as well that's uh take the yeah, a lot of our plants, you know, it's all good smooth, but you see a side where there's so much space now. Yeah. Because a lot of the production methods have changed. We're, we're not full of big old barrels and all of that sort of stuff anymore. We have big garage sheds over the other side, which I'll speak about a bit later on. But I mentioned Hans Irvine had a, a facility built while he was away, and by the time him and Charles Pellow got back here, it was ready to go. It was finished in 1892. And it's called the 1892 cellar. Now it was a good state of the art building, two, two different wings to it, two different sections, um, and, and quite a good size. Uh, and it still exists inside here because when Sepples came up here and took over, they realised it was soon going to be outgrown. The demand was that strong that that little 1892 cellar wasn't going to hold the capacity they needed. So they set to work building all this big facade all the way around it and enlarged it by probably tenfold or anything, roofed it all over. But if you can get your head around the fact that the 1892 cellar still exists inside this, this building, yeah, and we'll wander in there shortly. But if you look through the window, you can see the fence the Down the other end would have been an area for all the barrels, all of the wooden oak barrels, etc. So this is part of the extension on here. This was a big barrel room, so this would have housed the still over from the main building of the two sides with all these big old barrels. But eventually a lot of these small barrels would have made down the track. Um, but 
this is uh, part of exposed Queen Air users for weddings. We've here in the past few weeks, so we set up a wedding chapel in here, and um, most of the, uh, the, uh, the ceremonies take place out here, and we're heading to the 1892 cellar where we set up the wedding reception. To take note of these big old barrels, in these small ones here, I'm going to talk about how they use them a bit later on when we get downstairs. So this is what the old original cellar looked like. You can see there's two different wings to it. Um, but yeah, good sized building and, and, and the, there's a purpose built ramp. We're going to head down later on into the underground cellars. But yeah, it soon became way too small. So they built all of this around it. But we're going to walk through. So we've walked down here. We're going to walk into the bottom door around the back down here. And as you do, as you step down, you'll probably feel the temperature drop at the degree or so. These were all cut the size, cut the spec, and shipped out from Portland, Oregon, in the US, all those years ago. And uh, ironically, they were shipped to Portland in Victoria, and then uh, transported up here by uh, horse and dray. And if you think, oh yeah, well, that would have taken months to, to bring them out, and then probably about eight to 10 weeks to bring them up from Portland. And it would have been a hell of a job because they were big trees. For instance, this particular being here doesn't have a Join it until about the second last post down there. Mm. Massive bits of timber. But if you think about it, this area was full of those big oak barrels. There were probably about 30 of them all through this area here. Now, some of those hold five to 6,000 litres of wine at a kilo a litre. You can imagine the weight was in here on this floor. So there's another level down below us. So then, sort of makes you start wondering about the size of Oregon timbers they needed for the foundation timbers of this place. We'll go down and have a look at them now. Continuous solid piece of right through. Now, 12 litres? Yeah. It would have been all cut to spec. Yeah, I think the size of the tree. In fact, when they expanded out into this area, they copied pretty much, uh, but with cool copy. The sizes were right, but you can't get timber like this anymore. So no. <laughs> But what a, what, a, what a monumental task to build all of this from the other side of the world. Yeah. Now this area was called the Lamarge area, and that's a French term which signifies the, the process of traditional method, the French method of making champagne. We got any wine making experts here? No. no. Good. Neither am I. No. But instead of not talking about it, I'm going to explain it to you in as simple a terms as I possibly can. All right. So let's talk about making a bottle of Shiraz, a normal bottle of Shiraz. First thing to remember is that all grape juice is white. Squeeze a red grape, you get white juice. Some people think it's different than that, but that's the fact. So to make a Shiraz, we need to leave the skins and stuff there. We need to chuck all them in as well, because they contain all the tannins, just like tea leaves. 
to where we get the red colours and the, and the flavours, the fruity flavours. So we're going to crush it, we pick all our grapes, we're going to crush all our Shiraz grapes. Juice, skins and all goes into a barrel. Probably one of those big fellas up there that we saw. We've got to start a fermentation process. We're going to throw in some yeast and some sugar. Pop it all into those big oak barrels. And uh, they're traditional French oak, most of the barrels. In later years they use American oak as well. Put it all in that starts to ferment. What happens is the yeast consumes the sugar, converts that into alcohol, and the byproduct of that conversion is CO2, carbon dioxide. But because it's in an oak barrel, they can permeate, they'll breathe, so the CO2 can escape out through the wood. But everything else starts to ferment in there. And as it does, and it comes into contact with the sides of the barrel with that oak, it leaches those flavours those oaky, woody, nutty, buttery sort of flavours we get in our wines, reds and whites. Um, depending on the winemaker with the Shiraz, he might leave it on oak for six months, 12 months, 18 months, depending on what he's making. When it's ready, pump it all out, strain it off, pop it in a bottle, purify it, we've got a bottle of Shiraz. Other way of making wines, uh, instead of fermenting them in barrels in later years, they can put all your wine into a big open, open tank with the yeast, sugar, etc. Let it ferment in an open tank. Um, CO2 will dissipate out. Uh, but to get the oak flavours, instead of putting the wine in the oak, they'll take the oak to the wine. So they'll use like big oak shaving tea bags and just submerge them in the tanks. Or they'll even use the sides of the old barrels just the oak timbers and suspend them in there and let the wine agitate through. Either way, it's going to leach those oaky flavours. So if you look at your bottle and it says it's matured on oak, guaranteed it's been in a barrel. Either a big one, more likely these days one of those smaller ones, the hogsheads or bariques, but it's been in a barrel. If it says it's oak enhanced, it's been matured in the stainless tank and the oak has been taken to the wine. Does that all make sense? Yes. Yeah. Reasons they went away from, a lot of them went away from those big oak barrels, as we said upstairs. If you filled one of them, that's where it's going to stay. With the smaller ones, you can fill them, you can stack them and rack them as you saw up there, you can move them around with forklifts. Plus, if you were a winemaker and you put all your wine into one barrel and you've got all your eggs in one basket, if you muck it up, you've lost a lot. But if you're putting all that wine in 20 or 30 little barrels, you do all your magic with one or two barrels. If you get it wrong, you lose a barrel. That's all. You can then make the changes. You get it right, then you transfer that process in all the other barrels and away you go. Yeah? We're going to take it one step further. We're going to be like PLO and Irvine. We're going to make, talk about making the sparkling Shiraz in the traditional French method. All right? That's a little bit more complicated. So I've left all the I've left all the chemistry and all of that stuff, complicated stuff, out of it. Lots of old equipment here. I'll refer to one or two of these pieces as we go, but let's talk about making a sparkling wine. We'll talk the sparkling Shiraz, because we made our Shiraz. So now, we'll pop our Shiraz back into one of these bottles. So it's a quart size bottle, but notice the dome in the bottom. That's going to give us extra strength and that's important. So we're going to pop our wine in and we're going to start a second fermentation process in this bottle. More yeast and more sugar, the cork, and in the old days that cork had a V cut in the top and there was a metal staple clip got pressed under that little lip of the bottle and pressed in and held that cork in nice and tight. Because as we said before, the yeast is going to consume the sugar, turn it into alcohol and the byproduct is CO2. This time, unlike the barrel where the CO2 can permeate and escape, it gets trapped in this bottle. As it ferments, that can build up to pressures of about 80 pounds per square inch, six bar. That's a lot of pressure in a little bottle. In the old days when the glass wasn't as strong, these things would get bumped and they would go bang. To ferment it, it would be put on leaves, like you see stacked here in the photo. So, in our particular case, to get them down in the cellar, 
they would put 80 bottles at a time in one of those wooden wheelbarrows. And then they would take them down the purpose-built ramp, which we're going to walk down shortly, and they would stack the bottles either against the walls or in alcoves, which you'll see down there. We had this stacked nicely and someone's bumped it and it's all falling apart. You can see it was, a, it was an art work in itself, just to stack bottles. And you'd have a bottle going one way and another one coming back on itself. So they would stack thousands of bottles down there, 80 bottles at a time up and down. As it's sitting there fermenting, over its set period of time, so a normal white Shiraz, uh, uh, sorry, a, a white Chardonnay sparkling like a Fleur de Lis will be down there for almost 12 months fermenting away. Our Salinger uh, and our uh, better sparkling wines will be up to five years sparkling, um, fermenting away down there. Our sparkling Shiraz, no less than three years. And our show sparkling Shiraz made with premium fruit, no less than 10 years fermenting, putting them in our cellars on leaves. And as it gets spent, the yeast remains as a sediment in the bottom of that bottle, just laying there. We've got to get it out once it's ready to go. There was thousands of these shaking tables or riddling racks throughout the complex. Quite a few downstairs, but the majority up on this level. So if they were coming up to the ones up this level, these bottles would be again taken, 80 bottles at a time, very carefully in that wooden wheelbarrow up that damn ramp and bought and loaded into these shaking tables or riddling racks, as you see here in the photo. Front and back. They're locked in there at about 90 degrees. If you have a close look, you'll see these holes are cut on an angle and the board at the back is scalloped out. That's for a reason. Close look and you'll see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Once the riddler has loaded everything up here, you'll come through and you'll put a chalk mark on the top dead centre of each bottle. That gives him a starting reference point. Then he will come through a couple of times a day He'll give that bottle a little shake and turn it about one-sixth of a turn. As he does, he pushes it in ever so slightly. So that after several weeks, that bottle had been turned many times and bought up, see how that works? Mm -hmm. Because of that angle, to a 45 degree angle. Now what we've done without upsetting that delicate process of fermentation is loosened that yeast from the side of the bottle where it's rested for all those months and slowly let it work its way down to the neck of the bottle. Once it's settled, that's our result. Mm. It's dead yeast, right there. And that's exactly where we want to have it, because we can now get that out. Keeping the bottle upside down, they would be taken to a room over the back, which was called a disgorging room. It was a very wet, messy area. Tiles, floor, walls and ceilings. In there we had a series of probably two or three round shallow tanks about so deep. They were filled to the brim with a very cold liquid called a brine solution, like an icy slurry that's left in your esky after a party or whatever. It had a lid on the top which was insulated and heaps of holes in the top of the lid about so round. So the bottles were placed through the hole so that the neck of that bottle was submerged in that cold liquid. Leave it there for a couple of hours and it would freeze the wine in the neck of the bottle, trapping all that yeast leaves in the frozen plug. All our CO2 has come up here now, so the pressure is in the top end of this bottle. That's why we've got that dome there, it keeps it nice and strong. What we're going to do now is grab a tool and take that little clip off that I talked about, holding the cork in, that was called an agraph clip. Take that off. Give the cork a hit and the natural pressure will spit out the cork and that frozen plug of wine, taking all the yeast sediment with it. Quickly seal the bottle. We don't want to lose any more CO2, which is still up here, and we don't want to lose any more wine. We've already lost about this much. So we need to top it up. The bottle would be brought over to one of these apparatus here. This is called a liquid dosing machine. We've now got to top and replace that little bit of wine. Three elements would go back into the bottle. First, uh, our base wine, in our case, Shiraz. So a little measured dose of Shiraz. This bottle would contain sugar syrup, 
So just the sugary water um, to replace those residual sugars and that sweetness we've lost. And then we were given a little measured dose of sulphur dioxide, liquefied. That turns into a gas. It's an inert gas, a lot heavier than air. It will sit in the top of the bottle, act as a preservative for that wine. That's why if you read the label, it'll say sulphates in there. Um, plus, because it's heavier than air, it won't let the CO2 out and won't let the fresh air in. Just enough time for us to take it to a corking machine, whack the cork in, put that little wire cage over the top and twist it up. That's called a mucelay, French word for muzzle. Right. Put a label on it. We've got a bottle of traditional French method sparkling wine. All make sense? Yes. Very labour intensive. Mm. Now, to give you some idea, when we were storing in the peak days up to six and a half million bottles at a time down in, down in the cellars, turning over about two million bottles to feed the demand. That was just our winery. So you can imagine doing that with all of that, all of that wine. That riddler up there, the guy turning the, the bottles, worked here for about 40 years. He would come in on any given day and turn up to 20,000 bottles a day. It's before they invented RSI. You know? Yeah, and he was one of about three or four working here at the time. So it was an immense job, and this was going all the way around the world. So eventually something had to give. They had to find a different way of making sparkling wine. Um, and they did, through necessity become, uh, becomes invention and new technology, the stainless steel tanks came into play. Um, pretty much once all your wine's fermented, you could just pour it all into a big stainless settling tank, leave it there for a week or two, and just like mud in the dam, the, the yeast all settles to the bottom, just like it does in the bottle. Pump the clean product off the top. Because it's an open tank, we've lost all our natural CO2, but we can now carbonate it as it goes through. So we've got big tanks of CO2 sitting over there, most wineries have, and as your wine's going through, um, it gets in, put into the bottle, and it gets carbonated, and then capped and corked. So you don't need a sulphur? Don't need all of that. Sometimes in the big open, open tanks, they will put what they call a blanket, so they'll pump sulphur dioxide in there, which will sit on the top and help try and keep some of that CO2, keep the air out, but let it ferment away underneath and it, uh, the CO2 will bubble up and pop through it. But that's okay, we can now carbonate it on our way through, yeah? So if you're drinking, if you're looking at your wine and selecting, and it says that it's um, traditional method champenoise or method traditional, it's been through that fermenting and disgorging process. But things change there. We don't even use the cellars anymore. We've got big terrain sheds over the other side. Understand, the only reason they were built was for temperature control. We've got big sheds over there. You can play a game of footy in each one of them. We've got four of them. Uh, they're temperature controlled. You can drive semi-trailers and forklifts in and out. No more 80 bottles at a time up and down that ground. Instead of stacking the bottles, they all get dosed up and they put them in a big pellet. Thousands of bottles in a crate and they're stored over in there under temperature control. When they're ready to go to shake the, le the yeast out, we don't use the tables anymore. You would if you were doing a very small batch at a boutique winery, but they just put those pellets in a big machine that just slowly rolls the bottles up and down and around like this and loosens the yeast. Then it all gets um, put through um, under pressure because it's got its own CO2 in it. The bottles uh, are drawn out under pressure CO2 is kept there, the yeast is actually, it, the wine gets put through a series of filters, so the yeast gets filtered out, not settled out, um, and, and then it gets bottled as it goes through, all under pressure so it's containing its own CO2, yeah? That's a traditional method now, nowhere near as romantic, but nowhere near as mm -hmm. labour intense as well. Mm -hmm. The other way with the big settling tanks, as I said, it just goes through, and what you've got there with a non-traditional method wine is a double fermented carbonated white wine. Make sense? The other way, you would only use traditional method, you would only use a dedicated vintage each year, so a dedicated prop goes into that. It's gonna be good premium fruit, therefore it should taste a bit better, it should cost a bit more, 
and it's going to contain the toe CO2, so it's not even foaming at the top end. Yeah? Um, but I think the world's happy to drink both. I'd like to try sometimes to pour one and pour another and mix the glasses around. I can't really taste the difference. It's all good stuff for me. Yeah. Does that all make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah good. good. Let's go for a wander downstairs, eh? Now there's plenty of fresh air, plenty of room down there, plenty of light. You do feel a little anxious at any time, and it can happen to the best of us. Don't suffer this if we know what we're doing up to the rear end of the visible space or more. Initially consisting of only a 9 meter deep shaft entry and a single drive, successive owners of the winery continued to extensive the hand dog drives over a period of 60 years to sell the extensive collection of famous wines produced at the property and store them at an optimal temperature of 16 degrees. We are now walking to the underground of the Sepul, the Great Western. The drives or the underground cellar are a maze of tunnels which stretch under the vast property of an incredible 3 km being the largest underground cellaring system in Australia and have the capacity to store 3 million bottles of wine. So welcome underground. We're going to be wandering around up that end a little bit later on, but from that particular end up to this end, it's going to be about 140 metres. This is the longest section of, of the cellars, and we're actually down the bottom of the cellars. And I say that because when we walk out and came down, we actually walk down here, and we could be over a section area. Um, so when they dug these drives, they knew they had to stay and go to the contour of the hill to stay set seven and a half metres underground. Yeah, so as we get around the corner, um, it's all it's all flat this way, but as we get around the corner, you'll see we're facing back up here again. Yeah. Um, wherever you see it bricked up in concrete, this is all concrete. Um, that's a high volume area of traffic, um, and usually it's around where we've got ventilation, where we've got fresh air accessible, like sit here because it makes the decomposed granite quite dry and crumbly um, and susceptible to breaking away. So they would have bricked up all those high traffic areas and those areas with fresh air. Right? Yeah. And we're in the corner and then we look like we can As you can just see from the heritage listed, recognised by the National Trust, there's a couple of plaques here. That played a big game, a big part in the whole game of the whole city. Salinger drive, named after the uh, wife of Charles Peel, the first sparkling winemaker. He married Eleanor Salinger, and they, that family was winemakers in this region. Of, uh, well, they actually had a little store down the street, was their Providence store. It still carries the name today. All right, so what's down here, as you can see, there's hundreds of thousands of bottles. But during that period where South Corp decided to do, uh, take over, and uh, Sepples knew it was coming as well. Um, they built those big Gerard sheds over the other side I was talking about. So they stopped using these for fermentation, these drives. There was millions of bottles down here already fermenting that was still okay. So through natural attrition, when they were ready to be produced, they got taken out up that ramp and used, disgorged and used. And eventually the numbers dwindled down here. Anything they found uh, that was no good anymore, it was too old, the corks had gone, it had gone sour or whatever, no use moving them out. They're no good, so just leave them here. Eventually, the drives became very empty, and in fact, at the end, there was a big push to take anything that was still any good, move it all out. But it left it looking quite barren. That plaque back there is National Trust and Heritage Listing, and through that, there's a commitment to keep these places like this and old institutions, old jails, etc., looking the same as they used to. Mm -hmm. So it kept people in employment for a long, long time, bringing back and replacing everything that was taken out, or most of it, with water in bottles. Mm -hmm. Now, 90 plus percent of what you see down here will be false bottles. 
Uh, I had a lady on the tour the other month that said, oh, I thought I'd come and see heaps of champagne. I'm very disappointed. But she told me earlier she'd actually been to J-Ward, to the old criminally insane um, facility in Ararat. And I said, you said you were at J-Ward yesterday. She said, yeah. And I said, were there still prisoners in the cells? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, no. And I said, that's because things change and usually they change for the better. So I said... Um, most of what you see here will be uh, just water in bottles, but it looks visually like a thing. But it's nice to know that there are still little pockets like these old ladies still sitting down there. And we know these are authentic for a couple of reasons. One, and I'll pick up this fella here because it hasn't let me down yet. You can see the old cork with the metal clip, the agraf clip. Nice. See that metal staple clip going in there? And it's holding it in. And if I pop the torch underneath, can you see the yeast in the bottom of the bottle there? Oh, oh yeah. Right that sediment? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's authentic champagne. How old? A uh, bit hard to tell. Things do age pretty quickly down here. Like I'm only 28. Mm. Myself. Mm. Um, I don't know. Ever again. No. 40 to 60 years, maybe. Maybe about that old. It could be older, who knows. Mm -hmm. There is a, a timeline where they started using, they went away from the, um, the clips and started using the, the muselets, the little wire cages, but they found that they deteriorated quite, quite quickly down here and a lot of them would pop. Mm -hmm. um, and then they went to metal cap, of course, mm -hmm. in later years. But yeah, there's still quite a few of these pockets of old stuff around here. Right. Yeah. So we'll talk about that a bit later on because I'll take you and show you the museum a bit later on. Following up this way, you may notice all the, it looks like cobwebs on the roof and on the bottles. And it's not, it's actually Aspergillus niger, which is the term for black French mould. Yeah. So don't panic, it's not like your bathroom mould, it's going to give us asthma or anything like that. In fact, people have worked down here with it for probably about 130, 140 years. But it's not native to Australia. It grows in Europe in their caverns and and uh, dark, damp places, etc. So it must have got transferred out here. Maybe on some oak barrels or the old equipment or something like that, years and years and years ago. And once it got onto this decomposed granite, it just grows badly. A couple of things it doesn't like, fresh concrete, or concrete in itself and fresh air. Mm. That's why you didn't see it when we came down the ramp. Bricks and concrete and fresh air. But once we get into the bowels of the winery, on the decomposed granite, it grows and it settles on the bottles and it, yeah. If it was harmful to the health, they would have black down these drives years and years back. So people who work here all, work here all their lives don't have any issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. So black French mould or aspergillus niger, first of all, you just use the back of my hand, but it's, it's almost like a carpet when you touch it. Mm -hmm. It's not damp or sticky or anything like that. It just gets thicker and thicker. Just keeps growing sometimes, it just falls off and then another layer will grow. So it gets mm. it come up. Mm. Now the decomposed ground is interesting because it's all crumbled down, sandstone, etc. Yep. And it's quite easy to dig, it's not like rock. Uh, in fact, I've got fingernails on a kind of common supporter so I don't have any. <laughs> but um, you can see it's quite easy to dig and you can hear the little bits of grit in it. But if you just touch that, it's quite moist and soapy as well. So it's very stable because of that reason. It's not crumbly and dry like it would be near the entrance. So we could actually grab a pick and shovel and dig through there. And important to note, all of this was dug by hand. No mechanical digging down here whatsoever. And most of the soil, tons and tons and tons of it, we used to fill up the old gold mines in the region. So we don't have a lot of old, what you call digger's holes. In this area, they've all been filled up, and a lot of it would have been distributed over where the, where the grapevines now grow, which is a bit of an irony. They're yeah. growing in soil that they're going to spend more time in. All the up around this way, and you'll notice when you get around the corner, the bottles aren't stacked against the walls anymore. They're actually stacked in alcoves uh, back into the walls. And what that signifies is that that's some of the really old parts of the, of the winery, of the drives, probably uh, between. 1865 and probably 1890, they had the old coves. A lot of these bigger ones we're walking through were after 1892, cellar was opened, 
and they were used for access more than anything. So pull them around this way. Everyone feel all right? Yeah. yeah. Back up that way a bit later on, but I'll show you something down here first. Okay, this area is called the Brandy Nook. And Hans Irvine did make brandy, he had a little distillery upstairs. And um, he made brandies, and this, this was dug out to store his bottles of brandy, but he was, of course, successful at the sparkling wine, so this remained very empty for a long, long time. But in the mid-70s, the Seppel family decided to use it as a bit of a promotional uh, tool. They had these little alcoves put in here. The idea was to offer them up to the prime ministers of the day as they came into power. And this would promote the winery, uh, having that prestige of having your prime ministers with their private collections of separate wines down here. Now, Malcolm Fraser had just come into power after the dismissal of Gough Whitman in the mid-70s, and he was a patron of the winery anyway. He was from Balmoral or Marine over the back of the Grampings, and so he used to come here quite often. His uh, collection was kept in that little alcove there, and still, in fact, it still carries his name on the nameplate. Um, Sad day after he passed away. Um, we used to uh, he used to come here a couple of times a year and bring people down to grab a bottle out of there. But yeah, that that stopped after he passed away, obviously. And yeah, we had to uh, unlock it and uh, stack all the wine in a box and send it back to his to Tammy and the family. But uh, no one will ever use that anymore. That's that's dedicated to Malcolm Fraser. Uh, but he was the first and last prime minister to take several up on the offer. Uh, so instead of just having these empty, we've got past winemakers, um, past local, federal and state politicians have their private collections of separate wines here, and one of our Lord Mayors um, pays a fee to have his separate wine stored here as well. Nice way to impress your friends, bring them down, mm. grab a bottle from the Brandy Nook. <laughs> but you can hire the Brandy Nook out for functions, it's on the website, it's called Dine Deep. We had uh, about 16 or 18 people here the other week. I think minimum is 12, maximum is about 24. Uh, four different courses, uh, matched with fine wines, different levels of meals and matches, wines as well. Um, starts about 140 bucks a horse. But, um, that's all very inclusive. Great night out for the punters. Big job for us. Yeah, right. uh, we were cooking upstairs in the 1892 cellar commercial kitchen. Bring it all down here. But uh, they have wonderful times down here. Uh, some unforgettable nights. We've had people in ball gowns and tuxedos with string quartets playing here. We've had a little engagement and wedding parties and everything down here. Murder mystery nights and longest lunches in the drive, in that big long drive you saw. All different sorts of things. So if you're ever interested, pop on the website and have a look, mate. Nice. <laughs> mm. Used a similar technique to promote his winery with dignitaries because he was a politician, as I said. And from the turn of the, the century and the start of federation, uh, he used to invite dignitaries here. He'd, he'd open a new drive in Ella and get them to come up and do the uh, and do the uh, the honour of opening that drive. We had Lord Hope and Lord Huntingford and Sir Dallas Brooks come here. They were past governor generals of Victoria. And this raised the profile to a national level for his winery. Although he was exporting wine overseas, they were still sort of unaware of what they had down here. Um, he took it one step further in about 1910 when he invited a childhood friend of his who just returned to Australia to come here and open the Dame Nellie Melbourne Drive. Now, Dame Nellie Melbourne was our famous opera singer, born and bred in Melbourne. And as far as uh, the world stage goes, she was as big as it will ever get, I think. Um, she wasn't just Australia's darling, she was the world's darling. And after spending a few years conquering the world with her talent, she came back here and opened the drive in her honour. And this got not just national, but international media attention. Everyone wanted to know about this winery then. Um, and she stayed a guest up uh, of the Irvines in Vine Lodge for about four nights. 
And one night after, uh, after a meal and a few drinks, she alluded to Hans Irvine to the fact that she'd always had a fantasy about bathing in champagne. So never missing an opportunity, Hans got the foreman to bring a quarter foot bath up to the courtyard. And they put a little curtain around it for modesty and he filled it with the finest champagne he could muster. And they left it to it and she did. She jumped in and had probably still to this day the world's most decadent bubble bath <laughs> out there in Vine Lodge. Now the next day when she'd gone, the foreman said, boss, where do you want us to tip this stuff? He said, are you kidding, mate? She's world famous. We're going to rebottle this stuff and see if we can sell it. <laughs> so the two boys, yeah, they spent all day rebottling every drop. And at the end of the day, they hit a mathematical conundrum. We're still trying to solve There's many theories. Uh, they put 132 bottles in and they took 133 bottles out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is true as the day I stand here. I've got my own theory. She just found her own way to take the chill off the bar. Uh. <laughs> simple. But, uh, yeah. If you ever see the old Seppel Art Deco posters, there was, uh, there's some up in the cellar door all different themes, but there's one with the two waiters pouring the champagne from the bottle into the bath. It's all bubbles and the lady sitting there with a flute of champagne. That's the day Mary stood. Oh. Yeah. Now she would have stood probably about the third white globe up is the day Mary, Mel the dry runs up and down the length of the complex. But I'm not going to take you up that way because as you can see, there's nothing up there. It's a network of three different drives going that way and this one, and then up around the top. But they were used just for wriggling racks and access. They were built post the turn of the century. I wanted to take you into the old parts and walk you down this way, so follow me through. This is even very concerned about stick to the bigger area. So this is all right. You can see the old parts now in the back. And this is the green the great weather. Some of these areas have been ripped up because they're high traffic. We drive out, and as you can tell again, we're getting close to bricks, so there must be a ventilator shaft around. Oh, and if you look no, up, that's where we started the tour. Oh, and we're under the shaft house now. So 1865 down here. Um, I would have imagined, looking at it, that they, and this is all been destroyed in the concrete because it doesn't dry out from the bigger later shaft, they would have dug this little area here first, Anne Marie Blanc Pea Drive, John Pierre Truett. We've just come up Joseph Best, and I'm going to lead you up Hans Irvine Drive. So they would have been those first four, probably only a metre or two out, but then they just kept going. Yeah. And then they joined them all in the network. Yeah. Imagine coming down here all those years ago, 30 boxes of wine would have been lowered down, candlelight, in later years, Caro lamps, and you go to work down here. It feels cool, it's only uh, uh, 15 degrees, but if you work for a couple of hours down here, the humidity really starts to set in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, honestly. Um, spend the night at the Brandon Wood, you might think it's cold. An hour or two into the night, jackets are off. Following up this way, folks. Just a little bit there on the foot. You might get a drip or so coming down. A few old bottles in the rack there. But they they look very old, but um, you know, I don't know, probably twenty or thirty years. Area, you can look up and still see all the pick marks in the roof. Oh, yeah. That's just how they finished it off with the shovel and bits, But to give you some idea of where we are, so remember we were at the Branding Hook and we were looking, I said Dame Nellie Melba drives up there. 
these are the drives that run up and down, so we're looking across at the same end. But if we went to the end of that and we dug up seven and a half metres, we'd be up under the homestead, the top corner of the homestead, out behind the toilet block. You wouldn't want to get that wrong, would you? <laughs> so that gives you some idea. So we walked out of the shaft house and we talked about the homestead straight away. So that gives you an idea of where we are in relation to above ground. Therefore, the car park where you walk down would be up through this way. And where you walk in the cellar door, you would have walked into the front of the cellar door about here. Straight up above us, you would have walked in the main doors. If you think about it, we were over at the counter there, and I said to you, we're going to head down the passage and into the shaft house. So some of them will be there for the next there, and that ran into the shaft house. Follow me up this way, we'll have a bit of a stroll. Everyone still on the right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. That gives you some idea of the size of the place because we're now over in the northwest corner and above us is that big tank farm outside. So millions of litres of wine and tonnes of concrete and stainless steel tanks. And when they dug these drives, those gold miners knew you put a dome in the roof, just like the dome in the bottom of the bottle, gives you more strength. Now, having said that, I just looked down and saw a bit of a... because it's been so wet. That's about as bad as it gets. Right. See how it's just shaled off the roof? Yes. So I'll go back and tell the management about that, and they'll come and clean that up. But that's about as bad as we've ever had. We've had earthquakes and everything through this area, only just recently a couple of good ones. Seismologists from the gold mine in store come out and check it. The integrity's here, it's been here for nearly 155 years. So it's been amazing. amazing. Let's wander down this way, we'll just spin it around. It's a little bit slippery here because of the mud of the young seepage and stuff. Watch your step as you come through. Yeah, that's interesting. See how it just sort of shales off? They'll come through and they'll check all of this. I haven't seen anything like that for probably, well, I used to work here 15, 18 years ago. That's probably the first time I've seen it come down. Yeah, it's just, it's really soft. It's just crumbling. So yeah, that's interesting. Mm. They'll come down and probably spray a bit of concrete up on there. Yes. Do we have to pump much water out of here? No, very little. We've had one of the wettest winters we've had for a long, long time. Um, it's all pretty good. Where you see the moisture coming down, there was a ventilator shaft there. Um, so that changes. So there's, a, there's a flat plate there to stop all the vermin or rain or whatever coming through. No. But because of the temperature control, it, it fogs up. It, it, it nearly ices up in the middle of winter and that water just drips down off it. So it's just normal condensation. Sometimes, as you'll see around the corner, there's little drip lines. You can see here, there's little pipes coming out of the walls right. and it's quite moist. Up above this drive here, there's a big drain upstairs um, that all the water runs into off the complex and it's got a crack in it. So we know there's a leak there. But uh, no, you never have to pump these out. Mm -hmm. There are sumps in the area, uh, little pits dug in, but very rarely are they pumping anything out. Mm -hmm. Now, during that period, I talked about folks when um, they were moving all the bottles out of here. We had a winemaker here named Ian McKenzie, 
Uh, he started here in about 85 on his, uh, on his journey and retired in about 2002. But he was a great winemaker, one of the best, not just in this region, but world renowned. And he had a real passion for what he did as well. Um, he sh expressed concern, him and his team, about the preservation of all the old bottles down here you know, being moved out. So the company said, well, we've got our blessing, go through and gather up what you need. So they went through all the, re all the records, all the documents, and some of the oldest stuff they found down here in sparkling wine terms was about the late 1920s, early 1930s. And what they did was they gathered up two or three of each vintage that they could find from this year and the next year and the next year. There might have been one or two they missed. Um, and, but they, they gathered up a big collection. Now, <clears throat> the early ones were probably like the ones we looked at. I mean, no good. So you wouldn't give me 10 cents for one of them. But because they're still corked and they've still got yeast, you start collecting them into a collection, they soon become priceless. And that whole collection that Ian McKenzie and his team put together um, from all those years down, right down through the years, uh, Ian ended up buying that collection. Could have kept it anywhere, but he said no, the whole purpose is that it's safe in the collection, it's got to be stored down here. So they used the end of, uh, of this drive, <coughs> put some gates in, and established the Ian McKenzie Wine Museum. <coughs> Um, what we have here is probably one of the best collections representing any one winery anywhere in the world, I'd say. Hopefully all the old historic wineries have got something similar. So what have been priceless for it? Yeah. Because it's easy to make up. Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> and it's a bit of an unknown. <coughs> you can only guess what's in some of them. Yeah. But it's dynamic, it keeps growing. So if we have... Really good vintages. Oh, you know, get some purchased and uh, put in there. Having said that, it shrinks us as well. He was here about a week ago. I think he took about 12 bottles here. Wow. Okay. Just for a special occasion, probably for research and stuff like that as well. He's still in the industry, still runs. He's involved in the uh, education of, um, you know, wineries in the wine industry. And, Wine making and wine management and all that sort of stuff. He's in his, in his own, he's in his own. Very generous gentleman. But yeah, we've had some of the best winemakers from around the world, of which I have one. Uh, best, you know, the biggest wine writers, you know, Oliver and Ewan Hook, and, and all these guys have all been here. Um, you know, maybe had a meal with the Grand York, and if they were lucky, you know, you know Mackenzie was hosting, he might have come down and Grab the bottle. Mightn't have been any good anymore, but uh, not often you get a chance. No. Something that old, you know. No. In fact, when he was here, he fished one out, and he got up to Salvador and he opened it, and we all got a taste. And he th seems to think it was about a 1983 sparkling Shiraz. And you think it's something that old. It didn't have a lot of fizz. It had a little zing to it, just like you know when you put the little old nine volt battery on your phone. Yeah. And it gives you just a tinkle. It had something like that. But it was uh, really quite fruity and mulberry flavour. Yeah. Mm. And still drinkable, still quite drinkable yeah. in that regard, but not as bubbly and refreshing as a normal mm. sparkling Shiraz. But yeah, to think it had been sitting in there, what's that? 40 years. Mm. Mm. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I like to describe this as a timeline of history in the blood certain tears of this place. Mm. You know, anyone that turned the bottle or Whirled one and up in a barrel, up, up and down that damn ramp. There's a little bit of energy in this place. Mm. And these beautiful gates were made locally in store by the welding company, the Magnuson. Yeah. Great photo. Um, the best photo for these, I reckon, is sorry, oh, just, sorry. just back about here. You can get a few of those bottles in the side and that barrel and the beautiful gates. Mm. Yeah.
I say the palm tree is connected to uh, the sepulchre and sepulchre field in Sepulch Barossa because it's just covered in palm trees. It is. <laughs> and these trees were brought out from there, that was a sign oh. of opulence. Yeah. Um, so we had to save, there was another 23 trees went around in an arc over to the road that heads out to Moiston. Yeah. But when they built the tank farm and the rest of the complex, they removed a lot of those trees, but they didn't go to waste. If you go for a walk around Albert Park Lake in Melbourne or oh, down okay. the the foreshore, you're walking through some of our palm trees. Oh. Oh. Yeah. yeah, but Sepple's field is just covered in. Yeah, entire roads, um, yeah, they're just lined with them all. Joseph Sepple built a whole town. Yeah, but oh, that's what's called Sepple's field, isn't it? Yeah. As you can see, the ones with the alcoves are the older parts, and each one's got a name, and each one of these alcoves has a number. So we're right here now. And we walked out, and we come down into the reception area, past the big barrels where the weddings are held, down 1892 cellar, down underneath the Ramage where we talked about the wine making. Then we come down the ramp. This is that big long drive. So we walked up Cellinger and saw the old bottles just here. Come up into the Brandy Nook. Dame Nellie Melba drivers here. We talked about that. We didn't go that way because you can see there's there's not a lot to look at. Um, we came back this way up under the shaft. Then we came up Hans Irvine. Remember I shone the torch up and said we'd be up under the top corner of the homestead. Car park. Cellar door. All right. Cellar door sits here. Then we walked all the way down. All the way down. That's where the bit of the cave in was there. Museum. Yeah. Beautiful. So, about, a bit over a K, probably. Yeah. So that's our little tour, folks. Um, thanks for coming along. Thank you. Champagnes, we used to be able to call them. Hello. It's all about celebration. Um, if we look at a typical celebration like a wedding, two different sorts of champagne would come in or sparklings would come in and play there. Um, 
first one is uh, during the toasting of the, the official couple. Um, you normally do that around meal time. So you want something that everyone's going to be happy to taste. It's not going to interfere with the meal at all. So they'd use what they call the old Imperial Reserve style, which is now what we call the fleur de lis. Um, this is fermented for just under 12 months. Therefore, it's got a nice, big, soft, foamy bubble. Um, yeast is sort of background, so keep that fresh bread, little biscuit baked, and sort of um, nice and easy to drink. A little bit of sweetness here, maybe a little bit of honey or melon or something like that. Nice, big, soft bubble. You wouldn't get in the road with your meal. My, my mother in law doesn't drink any wines, but she's happy to drink this. If you don't wish to drink it all, feel free just to uh, pop it in there. You're getting that nice bit soft on the palate, sort of easy to drink, not too fizzy. Not a lot of fruit flavour comes in. Remember what that's called? Yeah. They're French words, muzzle. Yeah. Yeah. New, new slate. <laughs> new slate. Muzzle. New slate. Muzzle. Oh, yeah. All right, so that's the old Imperial Reserve or the, um, the Fleur de Lis. The other style, which is fermented maybe a couple of years longer, three to four years, is the um, what they used to call the Brut. So the Imperial Reserve and the Brut. This is our Salinger Sparkling. Because of its longer fermentation, it's going to have a very small bubble, really spritzy, really sparkling, effervescent on the palate. If I can lead you in the direction, there's a real fre freshness to this. Think on the nose and on the palate, think green apple. And there's a little bitterness at the end, a little tartness, think citrus, be a lemon or white. Green apple, citrus, very spritzy on the palate. This one says, Formalities, this one says, let's hit the dance floor. <laughs> so we get that green apple flavour with that, get a little bit of freshness there. Yeah. Oh, I'll give it a few more, a few more sips. It's a bit more uplifting than the other one, isn't it? Yeah. A little bit more effervescent. As you look in the top, you'll still see a little cloud. Oh, yeah. So it's CO2 is still sitting in there. Yeah. But if you just shoot that bottle out, shoot that cork out, it's just going to draw everything with it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you just go. Just twist. Let it pop in your hand. Thumb over the top, just just slight twist. Some people wobble it, but you can break the cork. I just do a slight twist, bottle or cork, just let it pop in. Yeah, yeah. On our special, on our premium show sparkling, we use a steel crown cap. Where is the cork uh, yeah, where corks have always come from over around those regions. Yeah. Um, it, it's getting harder and harder to find, but there's still. Yeah, yeah. You know, these, no, it's a real cork. These really are for keeping. You can sell them for a few years, like I said, we had an 1983 one, but they didn't have much fizz left in it. So, but all their premium. Wines there, we can, uh, Christmas time, this uh, sparkling Shiraz comes into its own, so you should have been able to pick up some mulberry, some fruits of the forest, mulberry, black currant, sort of um, blackberry, blueberry flavours in that. But chill it up and get stuck into it, you know. Um, sort of, it's a great summer thirst quencher and refreshing of your know, wine this on Christmas Day, or it goes with everything that I eat on Christmas Day. You know, but, um, yeah, yeah. We've always got one of these in our fridge. It's affordable, 27 bucks a bottle. You know, people come around and what's especially in summertime want something a bit different. You know, it's always nice. So that's it guys, that's our sample great western D to saw Victoria guys. So it took us from Grumpions to the great Sepples Great Western took us 31 minutes drive guys to the winery so this is a unique 
tour because if you see earlier we went underground so it's an underground tunnel winery tour dito sa ground pions and it's very popular why because there's a underground tunnel so the former owner of the uh, Sepul Great Western if you heard it earlier he hires some um, miners to dig for the gun for his underground tunnel and then put his um, winery wine there on the underground so the temperature under the underground is 16 degrees Celsius temperature you guys so it's a bit cold for a winery for a wine so it's a good um, ambience for the wine and you can see also the history of the wine how they began the owners how they put the wine inside so it's you he can put also a 3000 wine the ones underground so they call it the underground cellar this is the largest underground cellar in australia so this is a uh, they call it drive so they don't call it underground cellar door but they call it also known as the drive guys so you need to book ahead because they don't have they don't do walk-ins so you need to book ahead guys and at the end of it you can see also the underground the wines underground guys still there the bottles is still there the molds is still there and if you listen it very carefully don't say think guided tour they have a guided tour on the underground which is the drive so as in drive guys so you can see also it's very unique if you've been in our channel for a long quite long time now guys uh, we love to do a winery tour so sometimes it's a self-guided tour or a, a guided tour but this is a unique because it's an underground tunnel and and kind of weird cute and amazing too so anyway highway you can see also at the end of it we do the tasting tasting a uh, wine tasting so we have a small group we only have uh, just like another couple of us plus the guided tour so he just tour us around roaming around the area about the history one of their best seller is the sparkling shiraz or what type of a red wine um, but it is sparkling it's a different wine guys so like there's a bubbles on their wine so anyway highway this is the end of our sample wines d to the grampians hope you enjoy watching you learn something today plus you had fun for today's video guys thank you very much for watching thank you for supporting our video and my love shout out to each wonderful beautiful people of the universe thank you from the bottom of my high boat how much is like if you did enjoy our video for today yeah. and please subscribe if you haven't yet yeah. and don't forget to hit the bell button for you to get notified for our next video and yeah. please comment down below if you like this video pa yeah. and see you when i see you on my next one bye bye guys be good you take care be safe and mwah. ciao la.